Hello everyone, welcome back to Networks class. Last time in class we discussed shortest path interdiction problem. So this is the problem where somebody else has a shortest path and it's our job to make their life as difficult as possible. And uh, the way that we go about doing that is possibly lengthening some arcs in the graph. And the question was how to compute which arcs in the graph to lengthen. Uh, <clears throat> The second part of class last time was on computing uh, the dual of the shortest path. So that was this linear program that we had with various pi values and we spent some time uh, trying to understand what the pi values might mean. And uh, the plan for today is the following. Uh, first we're going to briefly discuss uh, how to do loops and gams. So uh, in the homework assignment that you've recently had due, uh, what we had was uh, you had to solve a bunch of shortest path problems where you, maybe you were editing which node the shortest path starts from and which node the shortest path goes to. Uh, and to do that, uh, it's useful to know how to do a loop in GAMS. So uh, we'll discuss that briefly. And then we'll talk about Bender's decomposition for shortest path interdiction. So uh, this comes from the following fact. At the end of class last time, we had this mixed integer linear program for solving the shortest path problem. But we were kind of unhappy with it because uh, for mixed integer linear programs to work well, we have to get a lot of pruning when we're doing branch and bound. But the, the program that we had, when you do its LP relaxation, it ends up giving you very poor uh, upper bounds. And so you don't end up getting a lot of pruning. So Bender's decomposition is one way of addressing that. And uh, we'll see that later today in class. But let's begin by taking a look at uh, some of the looping constructs in GAMS. So if you go to the class website and uh, look next to the GAMS 1 homework assignment, you'll see some solution files. And in particularly, there's one uh, solution file for uh, the latest start time. And so that's the uh, solution file that we're looking at right now. And that's the one that's going to have a loop to compute the latest start time for each of the tasks uh, that you're familiar with uh, by looking at the homework. So uh, let's just go through this file briefly to understand how some of these things are working. So uh, down here, you're familiar with this part. So here's where we read in a set of nodes uh, from a CSV file. Here we define an alias to the set of nodes. So besides the usual i and j, here I've also defined uh, aliases A and B. In addition to that, um, here we have a, a set of arcs that we read in uh, from a CSV file, similar to what you've seen before. We have some, uh, some acronyms and some arcs data. So for this arcs data, the first two columns are nodes. And after that, we have an arbitrary number of columns of uh, other data. And uh, it turned out for this particular problem, when I wrote the solution, I wanted to have some node data. So uh, there's a table, the same way that there's an arcs data table, there's a node data table. And now the first column is going to be a node. And after that, there's an arbitrary number of columns that contain data associated with that node. So that's uh, at the beginning of the file here. Uh, and after that, uh, the linear program uh, defined for the shortest path down here is very similar to what you're familiar with, except for the following fact. At the beginning, we're going to uh, define a scalar. So the scalar variable just holds a number, and it's going to be the current destination of the shortest path. Uh, so that's what's going on there. And down here in the network flow equations, particularly when we're defining the right-hand side, the right-hand side is going to be 0 most of the time. It's going to be a minus 1 if the current node is equal to end. So uh, that's because the shortest path is always going to start at the node called end. Uh, and then it's going to be a plus 1, but where the plus 1 ends up being is going to be controlled by this current destination variable. So the plus 1 happens when the order of the current node, so in other words, its number in the nodes file, is equal to whatever the current destination variable has in it. 
So that's kind of the new part in defining here. Previously, here we would have stuck equal one or something like that, but now we're saying equal to this variable that uh, we could potentially change later in the program. So that defines uh, the linear program over here. And now uh, we're ready to do a loop to try to solve for the latest completion time of each of the tasks. So at the beginning here, I've defined a scalar called the fixed completion time. So that's how long we want uh, the project overall to take. So uh, the project we want uh, to be completed in day 35. So at the beginning here, we set the fixed completion time equal to 35. In this next line, what we're doing is uh, we're defining an array. So uh, it's going to be an array called latest start time. And this array is going to have one position for each node. And the way that we're saying that is with this uh, parentheses i. So i is an alias for the node set uh, that got defined at the beginning of the program up here. So uh, if we go back and look. So going back to the top, uh, over here we said i was an alias to the node set. So that's how GAMS knows to create one spot in this array for each node. But I could have just as easily said here parentheses A or parentheses B or parentheses N, it would be the same thing. So then we're ready to do a loop. And here we're going to loop over the node set. And again, A is just the alias to that node set. And uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set that variable, the destination variable, to be equal to the order of uh, this particular node. So it's going to start out being 1, in the next iteration of the loop it's going to be 2, 3, and so forth. And then when we set the current destination, we can go off and solve uh, the shortest path problem. So uh, now it's going to solve the shortest path problem, and the shortest path is going to end at the destination that we specified at the beginning here. Uh, the next step here uh, is the following. So when we solve the shortest path linear program, it could potentially come back as being optimal, infeasible, or unbounded. And uh, there's a way to check that in GAMS. So the way to check that is to look at the model here. So that's the shortest path model. And look at the, uh, its attribute called model stat. That stands for a model status. And if that's equal to 1, we're saying that the program got solved to optimality. Uh, so here, the SIF statement is basically saying, if the problem actually got solved to optimality, then we're ready to compute the latest start time. And so the latest start time of this node A is going to be equal to uh, the fixed completion time plus the level of the Z variable. So if you recall, the Z variable contains the objective function. And for this particular problem, the objective function is negative. So uh, fixed completion time plus the z value, what that's doing is backtracking from this 35 days where we want the project to end. So that's the basic idea of the loop. Uh, as uh, GAMS loops through here, it's going to solve the linear program uh, many times. Uh, and then uh, it's going to put the answer of the latest start time uh, in this array that we created. So now we're ready to actually print out the results. So at the beginning here, uh, I've created a scalar called the minimum latest start time. And I'm just saying, give me the minimum start time out of uh, all of these nodes over here. So the reason that we're doing this is because we want to see if the project actually uh, were able to complete it in 35 days. And uh, the way that we can do that is to see if the minimum latest start time is positive or negative. And if it's negative, that means uh, we should have already started to some task that we haven't started, which means that you can't complete the project in 35 days. Uh, <clears throat> so that's that variable minimum latest start time. Here we're just opening a file, uh, outputting some header information. This loop down here, uh, I left it in the file, but it really doesn't do anything important. It's just uh, looping over all nodes. And here you can put a filter on the loop the same way that we've put a filter on various other things. So it's uh, really only going to access the very first node uh, in that loop. And uh, here it's going to uh, output its name. But really this has nothing to do with solving anything. But then uh, we're actually going to get into our main output statement where we're going to output the latest start times. 
And for this, we're going to loop over all the nodes. I'll put the name of the node. I'll put a long name of the node. So something like, uh, you know, the short name might be T1, but the long name might be something like put in the beams on uh, floor one. And uh, uh, this particular task, we're saying, should start by whatever its latest start time is. So that's how we output all the start times. And then uh, at the end here, we have a little if statement that, jack that checks if the uh, minimum latest start time is negative. And if uh, it is negative, then it's impossible for us to complete the project in the number of days allotted. So we're going to output this, uh, this print statement. It's impossible to complete the project in the number of days allotted. So uh, I encourage you to just download this file from the web page and play around with it a little bit. For example, try changing this uh, 35 to 25 and see what happens uh, because uh, the project should not be completable in 25 days. And so we should get this, uh, this if statement to print out something that tells you that you can't actually complete the project in the time allotted. Okay, so, uh, so that completes uh, this idea of GAMS looping. The main point to remember here is the following, uh, just the, the general structure of what a loop is. But the other point to remember is that uh, GAMS does not allow you to have definitions inside of loops. So if I try to move this scalar definition, for example, inside of this loop, I'm going to get an error. And another thing that GAMS doesn't like is nested loops where you're looping over the same thing. So I can't have a loop over A and inside of it another loop over A. And in fact, uh, this shortest path problem when we define it, it has a number of loops in it. So there's a loop over here, over J, to determine all the network flow constraints. We have some other loops over I. And so uh, there needs to not be a clash between these. And that's why at the beginning of this file, we defined so many aliases for the node set. And here we're using A, because A doesn't get used anywhere in defining the shortest path uh, LP. So, uh, so that's the basic idea behind looping and GAMS. So let's move on to the second part of class, which is uh, Bender's decomposition for shortest path interdiction. So the basic idea here uh, is the following. We can write an entirely different mixed integer linear program for solving the shortest path interdiction problem. And uh, uh, so I could just pull this out of thin air. Let me write it down, and uh, then we'll discuss what it means. And we'll discuss some interpretations on what um, made people think about writing this down in the first place. So the program looks like this. So maximize over theta and x. The objective function is just theta. And uh, the constraints are that uh, I have to look over all edges in a particular path of uh, Cij plus Dij Xij. And this is for all paths P from S to T. And of course, we might have uh, some constraints on our Xs. So something like the sum of the xij uh, less than or equal to 5. So that tells us how many attacks we're allowed to do. But uh, let's, let's just spend a little bit of time interpreting what this expression means. So this expression is saying sum over all edges in a path. And right here is the length of the edge if we have uh, an attack plan x. So an attack plan could potentially lengthen some of these edges, but uh, regardless of uh, which particular attack plan we choose, this whole expression tells us the length of this path P under this attack plan X. So this is the length of uh, path P under attack plan X. <coughs> And we've said that uh, theta has to be less than or equal to uh, the length of these paths for all the paths. 
So one way you can think about it is uh, like this. So here's our uh, number line, and maybe uh, this is zero right here. And uh, some path is, has length 30, some path has length 20, some path has length maybe 22. And here we have a path of length 15. And we want theta to be as big as possible uh, because we're trying to maximize theta. But theta has to be less than all of these paths. And so uh, theta is basically going to be equal to the smallest one of these. Or theta is actually just equal to the shortest path uh, with this particular attack plan. So the way to interpret uh, what we've written here is just to say this. We're letting you play with the attack variables x, and theta is just an accounting variable. And uh, we're just saying, figure out what, ver what settings you should give to the x variables such that you make the shortest path be as big as possible. So uh, really this has just a direct interpretation in terms of uh, shortest path interdiction because it's just saying make the shortest path be as big as possible. And uh, this program here is uh, typically called the full master program. So there's a couple of reasons that people uh, wrote down a program like this. So the first reason is you can think of it as just a game theoretically. So so game theoretically what's going on here is we're listing all the plans that the uh, shortest path player has available. So that's because we're listing all of his possible paths from S to T. And what we're doing is we're looking for uh, an attack plan X that uh, makes his best plan as bad as possible. So uh, that's this business with the thetas and the x's, is uh, when we pick a particular attack plan x, it's going to change the value of some of his plans. And we want to make his best plan to be uh, as big as possible. So that's a game theoretic interpretation. But really, there's just kind of a general linear programming interpretation. And it's this linear programming interpretation that makes this uh, solution approach very general uh, and why it's called uh, Bender's decomposition because it was first thought of uh, by a person whose last name was Bender. So uh, here's the basic interpretation. Originally in our mixed integer linear program, we had uh, a couple of things going on. We were maximizing over uh, the x variables, that was the attack plan, and we were also maximizing over the pi variables that were these kind of shortest path variables. So think of this uh, just inner program that's just maximizing over the pi variables. So it has some objective function and some constraints here. So um, this linear program has a bunch of extreme points. So here it, they are, I'm drawing them. So each one of these dots represents an extreme point. And the optimal solution is going to happen at the extreme point that gives us the maximum objective function value. So the top one here may be this one. But uh, this linear program also has a dual. So that was uh, this minimize over uh, these y variables. And this dual also has some extreme points. And uh, we know that uh, the values of the extreme points of the dual is always going to be bigger than the values of the extreme points of the primal because of uh, weak duality. So weak duality tells us that this minimization problem has to be on top of the maximization problem. And strong duality tells us that uh, when these two are equal is when we have the optimal solution.
Now, the only thing that happened up here in the full master program is uh, we listed all of the extreme points of this dual. So each of these paths here is giving us an extreme point in the dual that was listing uh, paths from uh, S to T. Because remember, this dual problem was just the one about where the truck goes. And so a particular extreme point there just gives us a path from S to T. So those are uh, all of the extreme points that we've listed here. And the minimum one of them is the one that gives us the optimal value. So that's why theta is less than or equal to all of them because uh, theta is going to give us uh, this minimum one. So that's just a linear program interpretation of this uh, full master for Bender's decomposition. But let's just take a look at this full master. Uh, if the story ended here, if I just said go off and solve this inside of GAMS or uh, solve this, uh, you should be relatively unhappy. And the thing that should be making you unhappy is the fact that this linear program is huge. And it's huge because of the number of paths there are from S to T. There literally could be hundreds of thousands or millions, maybe even billions of paths from S to T. Uh, and that's because this could be ex exponential in the size of the graph. So potentially, uh, this full master that we've written down here has way too many constraints for us to write down. So uh, that's why we can't solve it. So what we're going to do next is come up with a way of solving the full master, even though we're not going to write down all of its possible constraints. So let's see uh, how that works. So the basic idea is that we're going to have something that we'll call a partial master. So the partial master is going to look exactly the same as the full master. So uh, maximize over x and theta. And it's still going to have some paths as constraints. And so the constraints are just going to look like uh, cij plus dij xij. Except the difference is that instead of having all paths from S to T, we're just going to have this for all paths generated thus far. So we're going to start out with maybe only a few constraints here, maybe just one constraint. And as we progress through our algorithm, we're going to add more and more constraints. And the partial master is going to start looking more and more like the full master. And so the hope is that we're going to be able to solve the full master before we have to generate all of the paths that go into the full master. So let's talk about how we might go about uh, generating these constraints and solving the full master. So the basic idea is to just uh, start. So this is our solution plan. The basic idea is to just start with the partial master containing only one constraint. Let's say uh, for the uninterdicted shortest path from S to T. So that's basically the path that the shortest path player would take if we don't attack any edge. We're going to uh, keep upper and lower bounds on the full master objective function value. And of course, when I say objective function value, I mean the optimal objective function value. 
So let's designate those upper and lower bounds as theta upper bar and theta lower bar. So at the beginning we're going to set theta lower bar. So what's the worst that we could possibly do in the full master? So the full master is looking for the best interdiction plan, but uh, we know that even without any interdiction, we're forcing the shortest path player to uh, at least do some work to get from S to T. So uh, this lower bound uh, we can set to the length of the uninterdicted shortest path. And that's because regardless of what we do, we know that the shortest path player has to do at least that much work to get from S to T. So that's a lower bound on theta. And uh, our upper bound is going to be optimistic. So we're going to uh, set to uh, infinity. So that's because we potentially have enough attacks to totally disconnect this uh, shortest path player from S to T. And if we do that, then the p full master would have a solution of infinity. Uh, and so we're going to start out uh, being optimistic like that. So then uh, uh, our program here goes into a loop. So the loop is just uh, while theta upper bar is far away from theta lower bar. So the basic idea here is we have these uh, upper and lower bounds. And when the two things get very close together, we know that we're done. Uh, so if our upper and lower bounds are within some kind of tolerance uh, of each other that we've specified, then we know we're pretty close to an optimal solution and we uh, can call the job complete. So uh, inside of the loop we're going to do the following. So uh, we're going to solve the partial master. to get a particular solution theta hat x hat. So these are the variables that come out of uh, solving this partial master that doesn't have all of the possible paths in it, but it just has some of the paths. So the next statement here is that uh, theta hat is an upper bound on the optimal objective value of the full master. So why is that? It's because the partial master looks exactly the same as the full master except it possibly has a few less constraints. And because the partial master possibly has a few less constraints, its optimal value can only be bigger than the optimal value of the full master. And that's why theta hat gives an upper bound uh, to the optimal value of the full master. It's because the partial master is a relaxation. And so here we're going to set uh, theta upper bar equal to this uh, theta hat. So uh, because we got a new upper bound on uh, our full master. So let's think about what x hat means. So x hat uh, gives an interdiction plan that's uh, the best one, uh, but considering only the paths in the partial master. So x hat is going to tell us where to attack, but in constructing x hat, we only took into account all of the paths that are in the partial master and not all of the many, many possibilities that are in the full master. But nevertheless, x hat gives us some particular plan of attack. Uh, the next step that we're going to do is we're going to um, solve 
for the shortest path from s to t when the attack plan is uh, is x hat. Let's say call the path p and uh, its length. Let's call its length L. So in other words, we're going to take this attack plan, we're going to put it on the graph, uh, so this attack plan is going to lengthen some edges, and then we're going to see what the response of the shortest path player is to that attack plan. So uh, over here we're just generating the path that uh, that player would use to walk around uh, the particular attacks that we've created. So let's try to understand what happened here when we solve for the shortest path. So if we go back and look at the full master, when we solve for the shortest path, what that's giving us is just the smallest value of one of these right-hand sides. So remember that these right-hand sides are the length of a path under attack plan X. So if we stick in the uh, attack plan that we generated, X hat, and we solve for the shortest path, what we're doing is we're finding the smallest right-hand side out of all of the possible right-hand sides over here. And it's that smallest right-hand side that's kind of the most constraining constraint. That's the one that we uh, could potentially be violating with uh, our pair theta hat x hat. So uh, so let's write that down. So p gives the uh, most violated constraint in the master, in the full master. If it turns out that uh, the theta hat that we got, which uh, is now equal to our upper bound, if that's equal, if that happens to be less than or equal to the length, well, that means that this most violated constraint is not violated because remember, L is the right hand side, and we're saying that theta hat totally uh, agrees with that. So uh, if this happens, then theta hat x hat is optimal in the full master. So the reason for this is because theta hat and x hat came from a relaxation of the full master, that was this partial master, but they also happen to be feasible in the full master. So if they solve a relaxation and are feasible in the original problem, then they must be optimal. So uh, that's where this statement is coming from. Uh, on the other hand, most of the time we're not going to get this. So uh, otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to set theta lower bar to be equal to uh, the best of uh, whatever theta lower bar was previously and L. So uh, otherwise, what we're saying here is that L is giving us a new lower bound uh, to our full master's objective function. So why is that? Because uh, because the pair L x hat is feasible in the full master. Because you can make theta in the full master be as big as L for this particular plan x. But another way you can think about it, instead of uh, just this algebraic way, is that <coughs> x hat is giving us a particular attack plan. And we know that that particular attack plan forces the shortest path player to walk at least L. So that means that regardless of what we do, we can only possibly do better than L. So there might be other attack plans that force him to walk more than L, but we know for sure there's at least one that forces him to walk L. And that's why uh, L is a lower bound to the full master. So uh, we're gonna set, we're gonna update this lower bound, and uh, add 
p to the partial master. So we're going to add this new path that we've generated. We're going to add it to the pass partial master. And next time we resolve the partial master, uh, once we go back up to this loop, uh, now this partial master is going to include an extra constraint from our previous iteration. So that's the basic idea uh, behind Bender's decomposition for shortest path interdiction. But let's get, let's get uh, one more interpretation of it in terms of a game theoretic thing that's going on with this uh, big algorithm where we're iterating, iteratively adding constraints to the partial master. And uh, next time in class, we're going to see an example of this. But in terms of an interpretation, just think about it as a like this. It's a repeated game. between two players. Of course, the two players are uh, the interdictor uh, versus a uh, shortest path guy, the shortest path operator. And uh, the game takes place in rounds. So in the rounds, uh, they go like this. So first, the interdictor computes an attack plan. Then the operator produces a uh, best response operational plan to the attack. So <clears throat> the idea here is the interdictor computes an attack plan. That's this x hat. The operator produces a best response operational plan. So that's like finding the shortest path under this attack plan. And then part three is that the next time the interdictor computes an attack plan, he takes into account all of the uh, plans he's seen from the operator thus far. So every time that the interdictor computes a plan, he's going to remember all of the plans that he's seen from the operator previously. Uh, but the operator, all he's doing is he's computing best responses to the attack that he sees from the interdictor. So it's this interdictor that has memory. And this memory, uh, in terms of our algorithm, is coming up uh, in the sense of that we're adding constraints to uh, this partial master. So it's those constraints that really form the memory of the interdictor as he's computing more and more complicated attack plans based on the multiple response plans that he's seeing from the operator. And so uh, the, the last piece of discussion I want to make here is that the hope is that as we're generating these paths, we don't have to generate all the possible paths from S to T. So let me just give you an example of how something like that would work. So let's say that I have uh, here S and T, and I have three independent paths between them, and we're allowed to attack only one arc. So at the beginning, maybe we start with this top path in the partial master, and we say, OK, we can attack this uh, arc right there, and that would divide uh, S from T. But then the next time, maybe the shortest path operator returns uh, this middle path. And at this point, with one attack, there's no way for me to cut off both paths. And since there's no way for me to cut off both paths, these two paths are enough for me to know 
uh, roughly what the objective function value is. So if these two paths happen to have the same length, I'd know that the objective function value is just that length for the full master, because now I have a proof that pretty much regardless of what I do, the uh, operator has another plan to fall back on that he could use to uh, just walk around my particular attack. So in this particular case, it would really only take two iterations uh, to complete the whole process. But of course, in general, it could be many iterations. It really depends on uh, what the structure of the graph is, how many attacks I have available. But roughly, it's going to be as many iterations as it takes to prove that uh, you cannot do better. So uh, we need to generate enough plans to know that regardless of what we do, uh, the operator has some kind of plan to fall back on that uh, performs reasonably well. So that's the basic idea of uh, Bender's decomposition. Next time in class, we're going to see an example of this running on a particular graph that's going to maybe make things a little bit more concrete. So thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you all next time.